called? Bullies. Bullies. Right? Yeah. Say it again. Bullies. Bullies. Um, have any of you seen behavior like that around you, like in school? Somebody being pushed around or being picked on just because they may be different, they may seem weak, um, and more importantly, has any, any behavior like that been shown toward any of you? Have any of you been bullied? Yeah. It's not a fun thing, is it? I've been got bullied a lot. And that's not fun, is it? And, um, you know, we have to be really aware of what's going on around us. Um, you know, because people that are bullied sometimes, they can really break people and leave them behind, and nobody ever finds out about it. And if you see somebody being bullied and hurt by somebody, what do you think you should do? Tell an adult, tell, a pe tell an idiot adult around you. Um, do you think bullies have very many friends? No. Because they push them away, don't they? Yeah. But have you ever thought about why a person is a bully? Why do you think they become bullies? Because they're not happy with their own life and they want to take it out on you. Perhaps they could have been bullied themselves, right? And they could be broken. And they've been left behind. So God not only wants us to, you know, love the good people in our lives, but believe it or not, he wants us to love the bullies too. But we do still have to protect those around us and ourselves if it happens to us. But God really wants us to love the bullies and to pray for them. And remember yourself to be kind to other people because you can break them just as easily as you broke that crayon. And it's, not, it's never good to happen. It's not good to happen to you or to anyone else. So remember to pray for the bullies. And if you can show them love in some way, you might just be the person that can help change their lives. Okay? Thank you guys for being here this morning. Thank you for letting us do a lesson. If you'll see... Um, he's going to collect your crayon pieces, and he's going to give you a little treat over here if you'll go see Mr. Carl, okay? And thank you guys for coming out. We love doing this with you guys. <laughs>
morning, everyone. I hope you're all having a good day so far. Uh, it feels a lot better this Sunday than it did last Sunday, didn't it? We had all the rain going on last Sunday, but um, we've got a lot in the way of announcements to make uh, make mention of this morning. So one of the first things I'd like to make mention is, is we have some flyers out for the concert that's upcoming here uh, for the Singing Cooks, and they're right over here on this table. And I'd like for you to take those if you frequent restaurants, restaurants. If you frequent restaurants around here, uh, if you want to take one of those with you and put it up, that'd be a blessing. Um, I do expect that we'll have a full house. And uh, in 2022, the Cook Brothers were voted unanimously, unanimously as Southern Gospels Group of the Year. So I'm excited about that. They're, um, I grew up listening to them. I know Margie grew up listening to them. My grandmother used to sing those songs, and I know a bunch of them. So uh, I pray that you'll look forward to that as well as much as I am. I do want to make mention today that we have a lot of people that are sick. And uh, so you know, Wayne and Misty today were supposed to be ordained, and we're going to move that back to March the 5th. Misty's not feeling good, so do pray for her and Brother Wayne. Miss Susan is sick, and, you know, there's countless others. My mother-in-law, I think she's sick as well. So there's a countless number of folks that are sick today, so take care of yourself. We've got hand sanitizer every which way, so we want you to use that and make sure you take care of yourself. Uh, does anybody else have a, a announcement I need to make before we let, let go today? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Estelle McGuire Circle meets Tuesday night at Janice's home. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. All right. Right after church, the senior, we're the senior adults, the, um, Buildings and Grounds Committee, if you're interested in being part of that, we'll meet back here. Meet with Brother Sammy, the Director of Grounds. Yes, ma'am, Ms. Holly? Uh, meet here Friday night, 6 o'clock, meet here for the end of our supper, and then we're going to take them to the Hollywood Okay. Where we have a theater that's going to be our to show a Okay, that sounds good. So the youth group, Leatherwood, Axton Youth Group meets here Friday night at 6 o'clock, do you say? And we'll have a potato bar supper here, and then we're taking them to the movie theater to watch a movie there. So we're thankful for that. appreciate uh, those that have donated to make that happen. Any others this morning? Okay, um, I do want to make mention March the 5th. Is that right, sister? We're having a pinto bean and hot dog lunch after church to help support the youth program. Um, we want to buy some furniture for our new classrooms we've got going. I do want to say real quickly that as I walked around a Sunday school classroom this morning, I, I began to look around and see we're growing. And uh, what a blessing it is. Brian's got several in his class, and uh, there's a couple in the youth class. So I'm very thankful for that. And I want you to participate. If you can be here for Sunday school, um, I will say this, that Sunday school is 98% of the reason that I'm standing here today. And I, I come to Sunday school and got involved there. Uh, got to listen to everybody, and I'm very thankful for that. And, uh, you know, that Sunday school group loved on me and encouraged me. And that's where I proposed my wife at was in Sunday school class. And, uh, so we Sunday school is special to us, and it ought to be special to you too. Uh, the teacher spent a lot of time preparing, getting ready for that. So we do want to encourage you to come to Sunday school if you're able to. And I want to throw a shameless plug in real quickly, but Wednesday night Bible study is a fun thing for us. And uh, we have a good time. The last one we had this past Wednesday, we had business meeting. But the last one we started out with, who told it? So we started in the back of the room and we passed a note to the back and asked them to just tell each other, come forward. And I'll tell you, we had a blast. It was a good time. And you hear the giggling behind me. They were part of it. That's what it was. But uh, we, you never know what's going to happen on Wednesday night. So I'd like to encourage you to come out for that. All right. If there's no other announcements, let me see. Uh, yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. Ladies, we want to involve all of you in the choir that Sunday. Don't tell me you can't get any, everybody can. Um, but next Sunday, <coughs> 
Amen. Yes, sir, brother. I think uh, Robbie, uh, he mentioned that about the new fundraiser, uh, the hot dogs and the pinto bean. Uh, so back there on the bulletin board, there's a sign-up sheet for the men. Uh, the women, like we all have the women here, are so wonderful. They carry so much of the love of everything that happens. And the men are going to try to start setting up and try to, try to match their, uh, what they put into it. So there's a sign-up sheet. We're going to, there's some things that we need to provide for that meal. So if everybody would be praying about it and as the Lord leads you, uh, sign up for that and let's help make this thing a, a very successful youth fundraiser. Amen. Amen. And I'm, I'm excited to see the men stepping up wanting to help. What a blessing. You women ought to say amen somewhere. Amen. There you go. Amen. We're excited. And I, so it's, I think that started with our men's day, seeing all the men get together and participate together. And, you know, we'll continue to grow from that. Brother Ted, would you come forward and lead us to the Lord's Prayer this morning? Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for your grace and mercy towards us, Lord. We thank you for your spirit that's moving in this place today, Lord. May it surge up inside of us and give you the kind of worship that you are worthy of today, Lord. Lord, we thank you for your atoning sacrifice that cleanses us and brings us boldly before your throne of grace. So, Father, we're here today because we have needs. Lord, speak to our hearts. Touch us, deliver us, set us free with your word. Lord, may the anointed preaching grab a hold of us and make application to our lives for the sake of your kingdom and its advancement. And we all prayed in the name of Jesus, saying, Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> uh, <laughs> just, did I hear correct that you proposed to Jessica at Sunday school? Class? <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay. Uh, our first hymn of worship is 411. Let's stand and sing first, second, and fourth verses.
Yes, sir. <laughs> Daughter-in-law's birthday this week. Thank you for that. Anybody else have a birthday? Anniversary at all? I think George and Janice is discussing it. I didn't do one before I did. Oh, okay. <laughs> he smelled right enough for the ship. Amen. Well, let's sing happy birthday. Our next hymn of worship is 334, Blessed Assurance. Will you stand and sing? We'll do the first, third, and fourth again. <laughs>
You know, sometimes it's hard to get up behind that choir and preach. You feel like you've already been to church when you heard them and you don't need to preach it. So. Well, that was, very, that was very hurtful there, Granny. <laughs> Amen. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. And I, I, I looked up there and I saw... Yes, well, come here. We got a special announcement. Uh, Somebody can tell it better than I can. We'll let her. We we'll let her tell it. I want to thank the Maynard and her family for this wonderful job that they done on the Valentine last night. The meal was wonderful, and I'm sorry I was, a lot of them were sick and wasn't able to come. But thank y'all so much. Hey, don't. Amen. All right. Good to be in the Lord's house today, isn't it? All right, sister, will you put up the slide for me there? <laughs> Can anybody tell me? I don't know, brother, if it's in the Bible or not. Are we sure this is the right slides? Are we sure? I want to read some scripture to you real quickly, and we're going to look at these slides in just a minute. And I want to talk with you just real shortly about a, a couple of things that's on my heart, and I pray that it'll be a blessing to you. If you'll turn with me to the book of Ezra, chapter number 3, verses number 8 through 13. Chapter number 3, verses number 8 through 13. How many of you, when you go to a car lot look for a 1918 Chevrolet truck. (laughs) 
Now, I would imagine that this truck right here, if you could find one, would probably be worth more than a 22 Silverado. Don't you bet? And it's because of what it means in history, because of the significance of that truck. That's the first truck that Chevrolet ever produced. And uh, it don't look much different than a buckboard to me. How many knows what a buckboard is? Yeah, that's a wagon that you pull with donkeys. Amen. It's, it ain't much different. And uh, you know, you look at that and you think, man, how far we've come. Is everybody there at Ezra with me? Are you there? If you will, if you'll stand with me at Ezra chapter number 3 and verse number 8. The first year that Ezra is writing about in chapter number 2, if you go back and read that, you'll find where they're bringing in the materials. And the Lord said, the silver is mine, and the gold is mine, and the timber is mine. It's, it's mine. Go ask for it to be brought in. And now these folks have brought in, the, the Levites are coming in and beginning to work, and they're getting ready to reestablish the temple of Solomon that was torn down. And we know how much the temple of Solomon meant to the Jews, right? And the beauty that was there. David set out to build a temple, but God wouldn't allow him to do it. Solomon was allowed to, and Solomon had extravagant tastes. And he was a wise man. We all know the story of, of wisdom. And I think about with the many wise and concubines that he had. Well, how wise was he? You know? Uh, I've got one wife, and I'm thankful for her. But she can be a pistol sometimes, and I, don't, I can't imagine having hundreds of pistols around me all the time. I'm thankful for my little six-shooter there, amen. But what's going on now is this, this tabernacle is getting ready to be rebuilt, and we start in verse number 8, and it says, Now in the second year of their coming unto the house of God at Jerusalem, in the second month begins Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel and Jeshua, the son of Zos Josadak. And I will tell you, I read these 13 times, and I still have a hard time with them. And the remnant of their brethren, and the priests, and the Levites, and all they that were come out of the captivity unto Jerusalem, and appointed the Levites from 20 years old and upward to set forward to the work of the house of the Lord. Then stood Jeshua with his sons and his brethren, Cadmiel and his sons, and the sons of Judah together to set forward the workmen in the house of God, the sons of Hinnadad with their sons and their brethren, the Levites. And when the builders laid the foundation, are you listening to me there? When the builders laid the foundation, they didn't say stood the walls, it didn't say adorned, it didn't say painted or put the roof on or filled it. It says when they laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, they set the priests in their apparel with trumpets and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals to do what? Praise the Lord. After the ordinance of David, king of Israel. And they sang together by course in praising and giving thanks unto the Lord because He is good and for His mercy endureth forever toward Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout. And when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. Now I want to just set this scene for you. Imagine, if you will, that you're building a house. And you're excited. Jessica and I are getting ready to do some renovation, and we're excited about that. But sister, just imagine that you're building your house, and you've saved your life. Uh, your whole life to build this house and, and every penny that you have is going to be invested in it and it's going to mean something to you and to your family, right? Brother Brian, when you built your house, I bet you built it with your family in mind. Times it's going to come. We're going to have good Christmas dinners and Thanksgiving and birthdays. We're going to have good times of fellowship in this house and just imagine as they pour out the concrete and dig the foundation of your house and you begin to see an uprising. And you see a concrete laid, and then you see a, a main floor being laid there. And this is the very same thought. If you were to take and have a birthday party, or a Christmas dinner, or just a big cookout, because the foundation of your house has been laid, you're that excited that you have a party because of it, right? And these folks were so... Now you say, that don't make no sense, right? Does it? 
Hey, when you're excited about something, the littlest progress that you see means a lot. So I, I see now that they're so excited about the foundation of the temple being laid that they get the priest back. They put them in the right place where they can worship, where they can serve. They get trumpets out. They get their cymbals out. And they begin to praise the Lord because of the foundation of the house of God being laid. Isn't that exciting? Amen. Boy, that's exciting. Hey, can I tell you something? Mount Vernon is now 113 years old. And it feels like we've just laid foundation, doesn't it? Like we're going somewhere and we're doing something and we're growing and we're seeing God move in people's lives. We're seeing people want to rededicate their lives and lives. I'm going to let you sit down in just a minute. You've been sitting down a long time though, alright? So listen, we see all those things. But read chapter uh, 3 and verse number 12. But many of the priests and the Levites and the chief of fathers who were ancient men that had seen the first house when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes wept with a loud voice, and many shouted aloud for joy, so that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of weeping of the people, for the people shouted with a loud shout, and the noise was a heard afar off. You can be seated. I would tell you to buckle in, but friends, the 1918, 1935 Chevrolet and the 1918 Chevrolet, as we just saw just a minute ago, didn't have a safety belt. <laughs> we couldn't buckle in on those, could we? But look at that truck. Now we, went, we saw just a few minutes ago of what looked like a buckboard, and that truck had a whopping 24 horsepower in that 1918 model Chevrolet. Whopping 24 horsepower. Still better than riding a goat. Amen. <laughs> then they move up to the 1935. It goes to a 36, uh, 36 horsepower truck. It's got a closed cab. It has windows all the way around for comfort. In the first truck, you couldn't ride it in the rain because you get wet, right? Everything was wooden in that truck. Even the seats, everything was wooden there. 1935, we see a progression. Let's go ahead to the next truck. This is a 1947 to a 53 model Chevrolet. It featured one of my favorite things on a Chevrolet truck, that bar grill, right? You know what I'm talking about? This truck had five bars across the front. Beautiful trucks. I love those trucks. In 1950, saw the inter introduction of modern tubular shocks. They made improvements, didn't they? They got better because they wanted the truck to ride better. In 51, saw the introduction of door vent windows. How many of you have ever seen the vents in the side glass? How many of you have seen those? And how many of you have turned them things because you didn't want the whole window blowing on you, but you wanted some air, right? Man, that was a smart thing back in those days, and it improved. And the 54 and 55 models received rounded tail lights and a cross-type bull nose grill. 55 was the first series that were offered with six-volt electronics. Six-volt, six-volt, what we run our kids' ride-along toys on. Six-volt electronics. 12-volt electronics was an option. Let's move to our next truck. Can y'all tell, by the way, that I'm a Chevrolet guy? Has anybody ever? Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Like a rock. Hey, can I tell you that, you know, when I was in high school, my tag on my truck said, Rob's Rock. It sure did. I was a Chevrolet guy then, a Chevrolet guy now. But I'll tell you what, the price of them things is outrageous anymore. We're going to talk about that too in just a minute. In 1955, was the first year for the optional 265 cubic... I'd be a good car salesman, wouldn't I? <laughs> cubic inch small block V8 is a second series model with a wraparound windshield and the rare and desirable fiberglass bed cameo pickup. The fleet side pickups replaced the cameo in 58. The fleet side and the step side there is two different things. And then in 1960 and 66, the Chevy CK series was born. Let's move on. 1960 through 62 models use the torsion bar. Front suspension gives it more rigidity, able to drive it better. Models were upgraded to a coil spring front suspension rather than a leaf spring. In 64 and 66 were changed to a flat windshield and introduced the powerful 327. Amen. How many of you had a 327 in your lifetime? Best engine Chevrolet ever built. They don't put them in Ford. That's right. Woo! What else is happening in this truck? 
Brother James, I promise you, if you keep coming, I might preach about forwards one day. Amen. And we, and we go on here. If you look, there's a drive shaft going to the front axle in that truck. What is that? Four-wheel drive. Getting better all the time, right? Let's move on to the next truck. These are some of the most beautiful trucks, I think. I love that truck. With a 396 cubic inch big block V8 was enlarged to a 402 cubic inch because you can never have enough cubic inches, right? And it was still sold as a 396. In 71, it introduced the Cheyenne Comfort Package for Chevrolet and Sierra Package for GMC. And 71 brought back brought forth what? The front disc brakes. Isn't that interesting? Wonder why they didn't have that on the 1918 model. <laughs> right? Let's move on. 1973 introduced a crew cab option. I think there's probably two trucks sitting in our parking lot right now that are regular cabs. And everybody else has got a door on the back. Right? You start putting kids in there. You start, start putting grandkids and hauling different things. 73 introduced a crew cab option with a choice of three plus three, which is a three in the front, three in the back, or a lockable storage in the rear cab. Two-wheel drive uh, trucks used independent front suspension. So now rather than the coilover or the springs or the leaves, you ride down the road, that baby just floats, right? Can you imagine old 1918? Keep you away. Well, you weren't going to go fast enough to go to sleep, that's for sure. What about power windows and locks? 1977. Now, I know that some of this stuff was offered in other vehicles before, but we're talking about Chevrolet trucks now. 78 introduced the first diesel engine in a, 15, a 1500 to a 2500 or 3500 series truck. In 1987, the CK designation was changed to RV, distinguishing these trucks from the upcoming GMT 400 gen generation. Where is Cooney Frog? Let's go to our next truck. <laughs> Cooney Frog. What does that look like there, brother? Looks like your truck, doesn't it? How many miles is on your truck? 200. Like a rock. Amen. Praise the Lord. <laughs> brother, they come out with a 454 special in those trucks. It was black. With red interior, had a black grill, two-wheel drive. You couldn't get them in four-wheel drive. They were two-wheel drive. You know why? Because they had so much horsepower, they couldn't keep it all in the front. Had to just put it all in the back. Amen. <laughs> Updated fascia. It made, it made it look better. They made it more comfortable in the truck. And then you see this, Brian. You get this. They added the turbo to that poor old pitiful diesel. Diesel truck with no turbo has no power. So they begin to make these upgrades and get them looking better. Then the Vortex Series V8 come out. Debuted in 1995 with the high flow cylinder heads. That's an LT1. I had that in a Pontiac Trans Am. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. We're going to move on. Let's go on to the next truck. And this is up from a 2013 up. All those trucks are pretty much the same. In an effort to improve fuel economy, needs changed, didn't he? In 1918, do you think they was worried about fuel economy? They, was fear, they were worried about, is this going to get there faster than that horse does, right? <laughs> they weren't worried about looks, weren't worried about ride. They weren't worried about the problems that's going on in the world because those problems were not the same that you face in today's economy, right? So the GMC truck or GM Chevrolet increased the rake of the windshield to 57 degrees to give it better airflow. It had two available V8s that were equipped with active fuel management. You know what that is? A V8 motor that will run down the highway at speed on four cylinders. So four of the cylinders are not burning gas, but four of them are. Can y'all tell I know my stuff about Chevrolet trucks? Amen. Different problems. So it had to have a different generation. They had the V6s, the 4.3, the 4.8, and then the big boss, the 6.2 V8s. The 6.2 didn't have that uh, automate the advanced fuel management, but this truck had a fully boxed frame with three inch wider. It's three inches wider of a truck. Now I imagine this as small a people as Jessica and I are. If we got on that 1918 Chevrolet, she'd have to sit real close, wouldn't she? <laughs> she rides it 2021 Silverado. She's got a whole side to herself, and there's space in between us. The torsion and rigidity of chassis improved 234 percent as a result of these changes. It improved the truck's ride and quality. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to say this real quickly. As I said earlier, 
I think we're about done with the trucks. I, we can go off of that now, sister. And thank you for putting that on there for me. Thank you, Ann, for doing that. When you go to the car lot today, you're not looking for a 1918 Chevrolet truck because you're looking for today's answers for today's problems. Brother Brian, your need for a truck and a need, my need for a truck would be very different. I'm not pulling equipment up and down the road every day, but you are. You need something that's got the big diesel and you got need something that's heavy and has that fully boxed frame so that it'll hold up to the weight of that, right? So when you go to the car lot today, you're looking for, uh, listen, you're, you may not be looking at a Chevrolet truck, but you're looking for comfort, for quietness, for fuel efficiency, for something that looks good and something that don't cost too much, right? Good luck. You say, well, Brother Robbie, why did you talk about all this? What if Chevrolet would have stopped with the 1918 Chevrolet ton truck? What if all throughout history, in every battlefield, in every farm, in every community, the only truck that was available to Americans is a 1918 model Chevrolet ton truck? Ms. Gale, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want to ride the thing very long. Jessica and I ride about 40 minutes to church. Brother Gene said it's hard to keep up with a red fire truck going down the road. Amen. But Brother Gene, I imagine if you'd have been behind in 1918, you'd have been blowing your horn. That's right. I've told you all the story before. My sweet little mother, she had a 1995 Z71 Chevrolet truck. and We rode that to church. We were going to church out in Patrick County where my grandpa was pastor and she dropped out and passed a black Ford F-150 and she let it roll. I'm telling you, we're going to church and she's running a little late, got two smaller children. Well, I guess I, was, I graduated in 97, so I went too small, but I was probably laughing at mama at this time. And we go and we pass and all of a sudden that old big F-150 starts catching up with her brother James and gets to riding her tail. And we turn in to go to church and he follows us right there. <laughs> Amen. Kind of embarrassed my sweet little mama. I begin to, I want to compare these thoughts. And you say, well, Brother Rob, that's a whole lot of nonsense. I want you to think with me. When manufacturers today build a vehicle, they build it for today's needs. Right? I'm thinking today, I, I don't know that I'll ever do it. But those electric vehicles are looking more and more enticing every day, aren't they? How many of you go to the fuel pump more than twice a week? Right? Electric vehicles starting to look a little bit better to me. Now, I'm not going to get one today, I promise you, but I want somebody to figure it all out before I go there. But they're building vehicles for today's need, not those of 1918. You say, well, why is it, Brother Robbie? Because people have different needs now than they did in 1918. My grandpa still wears a long sleeve shirt. I don't care if it's 100 degrees or 2 degrees. My papa is going to be wearing a long sleeve shirt. Most fellows my age don't do that. Right? And when it gets hot, I'm going to wear a short sleeve shirt. I didn't start wearing short breeches for a long time, but uh, after I got out of high school, I started wearing short breeches every once in a while. I don't wear them much now. My legs are really, really white. You wouldn't want to see them. Things change with generations. <laughs> Y'all pray for me. Things change with generations. My son doesn't have the same needs that his father had when I was his age. Now, there are some things that's going to be comparable. What was the similar things about all these trucks? All of them had five wheels, didn't they? Yeah. Praise the Lord, I get to get on you now. A steering wheel is a wheel, and then there's four wheels and tires. So, yes, five wheels. Amen, Miss Gail. I'm going to make her sit with you if she don't start behaving. Yes. The spares are six. Not all of them had spares, but there is, there's a thing. Some, a new problem arises, so they add a spare tire to it. But can I ask you something? Can you imagine, Brother Wayne, let's, let's talk about that spare tire for just a minute. You've got these engineers in there, and they're thinking about cost, and they're thinking about how we're going to build this truck to be what we need for today's needs. And they say, well, you know what? Last week I was coming down the road in my old 1918 truck, and listen, I see you driving that 33 model. And you know what would make sense to me if a tire went flat to have one somewhere on that vehicle so you could change it? Right? 
And they all start looking at each other like a calf in a new gate and says, why didn't we ever think of that before? Right? And then I'm looks at it and says, well, I just don't know. It will cost too much. Right. Well, I just don't know if we really need that. Well, we've never done it that way before. Are you listening to me? Amen. So what if in this time that we live now and they're not looking for solutions that we still had the big 6.2 Chevrolet motor that got about five miles to the gallon and you're pulling equipment with it down the road, Brother Brian, and you're thinking, man, this truck's doing a good job, but it's costing me an arm and a leg to have it. When you could get that diesel that may cost more at the fuel pump, but it's going to last you longer and it's built for a specific purpose, right? Yeah. Are you listening to me? You say, well, Brother Robbie, how does that apply through the church? I'm glad you asked. In Ezra chapter 3 and verse number 8, we see the temple being built. But it's just the foundation that's being laid. And we see the excitement thereof. In verse number 10, it says, When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, they set the priests in their apparel with trumpets. Listen, they got dressed up just like they were going to the house that Solomon built. And they were excited to do it because it was something that they knew was the beginning. Was it going to be Solomon's temple? No. But it was going to be something that God would use right then and there. In that time frame, in their situation, God was building them a house. And they began to get excited about it. They've been refugees from their own country for some time. And they come home and they need a place to worship. And they see the foundation being laid and you know what they do? They put the people in place. They've got a plan in place and they begin to worship God. Begin to worship Him. The amount of excitement that's going on there, I just can't even imagine. But let me ask you something. When's the last time you got excited about something that's going on in the house of God? Are you listening? Now, this is where it gets to be, oh me or amen. Are we excited that we're seeing growth Amen. We ought to be. But you know what, Brother Robbie? We don't have a big enough church. Oh, me. But you know, Brother Robbie, if we have a lot of people walking up down the carpet, they're going to run a path in it. Now, I'm being exact. I'm just exaggerating, okay? But sometimes the things, we lose sight of the glory of God because we're too worried about things. And if God has left this for us to be good shepherds of and good stewards, listen, I'm not talking about we go out and empty the bank account and do wild, crazy things. But listen, what I am talking about is when God's moving, He expects us to invest in it, not only with our money, but with ourselves. Be excited. Get charged up because God's soon coming back. And He don't want to see you sitting on a pew being the mopey. Amen? You know what a mopey is? <laughs> Can I tell you something? We've seen people get saved in the last six months. We've seen people baptized. We've seen people rededicate their lives. People wanting to come and wanting to be part of the church. We've seen the attendance grow. We've seen Sunday school classes open. We've seen uh, families come in. We've seen all the things that God has asked us, that we've asked God of, and He's blessed us with it. And listen, we, get, we just sit here like God's not doing anything. I trust God. Amen. I believe God. And when he says, yes, I will bless you if you'll do these things, if you'll just get in order and follow the Lord, and listen, we can expect him to bless us. Sister, sometimes it is taking a step of faith, starting with two kids in your class. But watch how God blesses. I'm, dude, can I tell you all something right here, right now? I'm claiming for our church the youth in this area, what Holly's doing and working with those young people, what the other churches are doing and working with young people, and what you're starting to do here now, I believe that God is going to bless that. And I tell you, you can't put a price tag on those things. You can't. You say, well, Brother Robbie, I, know, I want to see the church go on for years and years, then you've got to invest in what's here today so that it can come in years and years. The temple being built and the excitement. I ask you again, when's the last time you got excited about something? What about the wet blanket crowd? Amen. The wet blanket crowd. And can I tell you something? I'm not, I don't, there are times that I'm part of that crowd, the wet blanket committee. 
Sometimes your pastor is one of those. Can you all be honest? You've been on that side of it too. Well, what do we need to do that for? I think if we did it this way, amen, are we, are we being, can we just be honest with one another? If you want to hear the truth, we need to tell each other the truth. And there's sometimes that I need to hear the truth too. Hey, I get discouraged just like you do. I get, Brother Wayne, some of the best advice you've ever given me over the phone. If I need somebody to tell me straight, call, y'all call Wayne Harris, amen. You know what he told me? He says, you need to grow some thicker skin. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, brother. Thank you. You know what that is? It's a man that cares enough about me and about this church to put me in my place when I need it. Amen? And I want to try and do the same for you when you need it. Hey, you say, well, don't do it in a mean way, brother. Wayne wouldn't mean to me. He just told me what I need to hear. Listen, there's been times you say, well, what do you mean? I've I've thought about throwing my hands up and giving up. Jessica has. We've talked about things. Listen, because of something silly that goes on. And all, hey, you've all been there. We just want to say, well, I just won't go back. Well, praise the Lord, who are you hurting? Who are you hurting? The wet blanket crowd. This crowd here begin to cry. And they begin to say, well, it doesn't look like it used to. It'll never be what it was. God's done with America. This church ain't never going to amount to anything. We'll always be this small country church that, that hell, yeah, we'll, we'll have our boons and we'll have our, our times, but listen, we'll never get to be anything more than what we are. With that attitude and that less of a belief in God, you're exactly right. Amen. If you'll trust the Lord, lean not on your own understanding, but acknowledge Him in all your ways and you'll see a difference. How many of you have heard about uh, revivals of yesteryear? How people would walk in droves to get saved? And I thank God for it. I thank God for it. But just like that 1918 Chevrolet we looked at in a 2021 Chevrolet, they still had the same heart, that engine. It may have changed throughout time, but listen, it's still the heart of it, and that's what the church is. That's the heart. And then you got the steering wheel, and that's the Lord. He's the controls, amen, because He's the head of the church. He's, uh, hey, that stuff is never going to change. Amen. And as long as we honor the Lord and we know that, listen, we can, we can still see revival. We can still see people get saved. We can still see the church grow. We can still see all these things happen. But if you're the person that says it'll never work, you're going to be the miserable one. Revival would go on for weeks and some of the whip blanket crowd would say. Revival would go on for weeks and churches were more spiritual back in those days and preachers preached with power. Singers sang heaven down. How many of you have ever heard these statements? Just imagine if you're not a Jew or even if you were a Jew in those days and you're watching something happen And believe you, me, this community sees what's going on in this church. Are you listening? Not only the community, but those outside of our community that watch it on Facebook and and watch and see what the Lord is doing in our church. Hey, we're affecting people all across the country right now. But I could and you could see the work that's going on and find our spot on the pew of do-nothing and say, well, it used to be better. It used to be more spiritual. It used to be a better choir. It used to be a better preacher. It used to be more people coming. It used to be more children. It used to be. Can I tell you something? You all take it used to be and throw it in the trash where it belongs. Because we don't live in the used to be. We live in the here and now. And God is moving in our church. And God is moving in our people. God is moving in our community. And we ought to be thankful for that. See, what happens is when we as Christians start sitting on the side and sitting in our pew and do nothing, somebody else sees it or somebody else hears it. And they'll get a confused message. How many of you have ever worked a job and you go in and, 
And your immediate boss tells you to do one thing and then his boss tells you to do another. And you've got a confused message, right? And all that does is give you confusion about what you can do and what you are expecting. And there should be no confused message about this place. Are you listening to me? God is moving. You know it. I know it. We know it because we feel Him here in our services. We know it because we see lives changed. People giving themselves to the Lord. The people couldn't tell if they were excited or discouraged. Can I tell you, there ought to always be a time that the people know where the church stands. In Haggai chapter 2, later on in the Bible, you'll find this in chapter 2, verse number 3 and 7, that the result of the temple, the temple being rebuilt was the same. People come to worship the Lord. Was it Solomon's temple? No. No. Can I tell you that this, this uh, Mount Vernon Baptist Church is not the same church it was 100 years ago. Right. And if it was the same church, it wouldn't stand the way it does today. People's needs change, right? Now, I want to say real quickly, I don't believe that their need for the Lord changes. Everybody from that time up to now has the same need. We all need the Lord. We all need to be saved. We all need to be set apart. All those things are, are there. But we can't live in the past and expect God to bless our future. I'm moving on. Quick, man, it's already 12 o'clock. <laughs> God's not changed, as I said. Hebrews 13 8, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and forever. Salvation's not changed. It's still by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And God's word's not changed. It's the same thing that we're saved by. Number three, we need to realize that the good old days are just that. I want to honor the good old days. Our church is rich in heritage and rich in tradition. But there comes a point where you honor those days and you leave those traditions because they don't meet the needs of today. That's Some of you are going to be upset with me when you go home and you all have good conversation about that and I hope you do. I hope you do. I hope you do. There was a time we didn't have enough people to staff the church. We do now. The needs have changed. The requirements should change with that. Amen. Having people that are loving the Lord, serving the Lord, having those people in place. Listen, things have changed here. We, we, we have a director's group now. You know what the director's group are doing? They'll handle the, the, the secular stuff, the, the physical needs of the church. That's what they'll handle. And the deacons are going to handle the spiritual stuff. And that's a change from what we did even last year. It's a change, but it's a needed change. We need men that are going to get on their face before God and going to minister to others and pray for others. That's what the deacons will do. And we need people to help make decisions and make decisions about what goes on in this place. Somebody asked me the other day, you, listen, I'm not complaining. I want you to understand that I'm not complaining. I love pastoring this church. I'm in the best place I've been spiritually in my life. Physically, financially, God has blessed me beyond measure. And I'll tell you this, I think it's because one day I said yes. Amen. Just being honest, I think it's because one day I got over myself and over my sin and my shame and my past and I said, you know what? I don't have those same needs anymore. I'm a different person and God began to bless me for that. And I pray that God's blessing our church because at one point I said yes. But just as I have, you'll have to. The God of the good old days is still today saying God. He still lays before us. The goodness of God still lays before us. So Brother Robbie, what about all the stuff that's going on, the shooting in Michigan, the mall shootings, all that stuff? Hey, that's just pointing us more toward the Lord whom we need to seek. That's just pointing us right back to the church house. Get in where you can know that you're safe with loved ones and worship the Lord because He is coming. There's different needs today than there were years ago. We need to stop in Matthew chapter 18. You can read that later, but it does tell this. It says this. Can I, I want to just talk about discouragement for just one minute if you'll let me. Discouragement. You know what discouragement does? It takes people that are excited about doing something for the Lord and makes them bitter 
and causes them to lose interest in doing what, they, what God's called them to do. And I love to hear you sing. But if every time you got up and sung, somebody's come to you, well, I think you sung it in the wrong key. <laughs> right? Or, Raymond, you do everything around here, but if somebody was critical of the way you took out trash, you wouldn't want to take it out all the time, would you? Think about that. And the Bible says in Matthew chapter 18, it would be better for a person to have a millstone hung around their neck and thrown into the lake than to discourage God's people. Amen. Can I tell you something? If you discourage and you discourage call, right? And then you've discouraged somebody that has influence. And those that have influence has passed back. Just like we on Wednesday night, our story went back and forth and back and forth. Even though it may be something simple, if they get discouraged and it goes one way or the other, listen, it'll affect the whole church. We've got to guard against that discouragement. We've got to guard how we talk to people. We've got to guard our minds and our hearts and say, is this of God or is it of man? And if it's of God, get behind it. We need to stop relying on the past blessings and expect God to give us our blessings for today. Amen. Solomon's temple was gone, never to be rebuilt, but God was able to fill the new temple. <laughs> When you question and you're critical, listen, I'm a critical person by nature. I take what's called in my house the crazy pill. <laughs> it helps me to not be so critical of everything because I am. I'm a naturally, crit I'm, I'm just telling you my weaknesses right now. Am I lying? I'm, kids, am I lying? I'm a natural, just Allison, you'll tell them, I'm naturally critical, am I not? She was talking about me this morning. I was talking about something I don't remember. She said, hmm. I said, What? She said, you're spending all your energy judging somebody else on a Sunday morning. I should have said, well, yeah, your hair is curly. It's hard when they're right. It's hard when they're right. Listen, we, God's able to fill the temple. Even though it wasn't what people wanted or what they expected, God still blessed it. Can I tell you this? We need to look forward to what lies ahead. We prayed, last year we prayed for babies. And they're here. Amen. This year we're praying for youth. We've got them started. Started with two babies there for a while. Little, little Oliver there and a couple of other small ones. And then you start seeing 10 and 12 babies at a time. And what are we going to do? Preacher, I can't do this no more. I've raised my grandbabies. No, 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 no. Right? Amen. Even Jessica, Jessica says, no, no, no. <laughs> Sometimes it's difficult, but what a blessing it is. It tickled me to death. If little Oliver stand up here and pay attention to what you said this morning about the broken crayon. And when he broke it, he looked at it and he looked at you and he listened to what you had to say. And when it was done, what did he do? He walked over here and gave me a hug. Can I tell you something? Is that not worth saying yes once in a while? I'm preaching like it might be my last sermon. Amen. <laughs> Can I tell you this? We need to encourage young Christians. We need to encourage people. We need to encourage those that are willing to step up. Can I tell you something? If you're, willing, if you're not willing to step up, don't you dare be critical of somebody that is. Amen. Don't you dare. Do not, do not put your foot into water that God's called you into, but you said no. Don't put your foot back in it. Not unless you're going to step into it with both feet and say, Father, I'm sorry. Amen. Father, I'm sorry. I need to do what you call me to do. Don't be critical of somebody that steps in when you won't do it. And somebody else, God, God lays that burden on somebody else. I told Brother Billy a long time ago, and I believe it's the Holy Spirit because it stuck with me too, but nobody can take your place in the kingdom of God. Nobody. Now, God might move somebody else in there to help and work, but God has a plan for you, and He expects you to do it. Amen. Encourage those that are willing. And my final thought is be a help, not a hindrance. Be a help, not a hindrance.
there's times that you will find yourself being a hindrance. There's times I found myself being a hindrance. As I was saying a while ago, somebody asked me, how can you pastor the church and it doing as well as it is and, and work a full-time job and keep everything together? Because God has filled this church with good people. I don't have to do everything. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. You can give yourselves a pat on the back. I don't worry about music on Sunday morning. I know Jensen and Janice has got that covered. I don't worry about Sunday school. I know it's covered. I don't worry about buildings and grounds. I know it's covered. I don't worry about the women's group. I know it's covered. I don't worry about the men getting together. Brother Ted's going to beat y'all until you get here. Amen. Hey, listen, it's covered. I don't worry about finances. We've got people in place to do those things. I don't have to worry about that, and God has blessed me with that. I could not pastor this church if it weren't that way. So often... In my previous years of ministry, I found myself trying to do everything. And boy, did I get burnt out quick. Right. Can I tell you, if you try and take on everything and do it all by yourself, you'll get burnt out quick too. Start looking around because there's people sitting your left and your right behind you and in front of you that can help you right where you're at if you're willing to give them a chance. Well, that don't look quite like what... Praise the Lord. I don't look like somebody come from 1918 myself, I'm sure. That old 1918 Chevrolet, if you were to park it beside my truck out there today or beside Cooney Frog's truck, there's a lot of advantages to having that newer vehicle. Now listen, again, I'm not saying we go in and we change everything about the church. We're not doing that. We're not. But when somebody has a blessing of an idea, boy, we ought to get behind them and push them. Amen. When somebody's willing to work, we ought to get behind them and push them. And if we do, we'll see the excitement that Solomon's temple, this, the second temple that was being built. We'll see that excitement again just at the foundation. Let's all stand to our feet. Father, we thank you again for loving us so much that you do. And God, I thank you for letting my voice hold out this morning. And God, I pray in my ministry that you've given me. Lord, I, I'm not allowed to even say it's my ministry. It's a ministry that you've given me part of. Father, help me to be an encouragement and not a discouragement. Father, help me to say the right things at the right time. Help me to see people that have potential, have been gifted spiritually, and have a heart to serve you. Help us as a church to see those people and use them. And Father, help us to not be so dismissive of others when they do have something that is beneficial to the body of Christ. Lord, that builds up your kingdom, that spreads your word, Help us to not be dismissal of that. Help us to find ways of encouragement. Father, we're going to love you through it all because it is because of you that we have love. And I pray that you'll just help us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. If you want to come pray this morning as she's playing, we won't have any song. You can bow your head and close your eyes right where you're at. If you want to come pray, Father, help me to see your vision. Would you come this morning? Help me to be an encourager. Would you come this morning? Father, show me where you want me to work. Would you come this morning? There's folks gathering around the altar. Would you come? Father, you know our needs. Would you help us this morning?
brother that's sufficient, you can be seated. If you will, this morning, if you have a praise, would you lift your hands? I've got a praise, yes, sir, brother. Praise the Lord. Amen. Brother Ted. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Amen. Any others across the room this morning? Yes, ma'am. I know it's not an easy job at times, and that I just pray that all of us will take time to encourage them more. I appreciate that. I, I want to say that I thank the church for the encouragement. I got cards this week that I'm so thankful for. That just just a note saying we love you. I mean that, that meant the world to me and, and Jessica both. So thank you all for that. And uh, I had a sister pay for my breakfast one morning. This past was the past weekend, and uh, we saw some friends out in, in Madison, and they paid for my breakfast. And that, so you say, well, what do you mean by that? I don't expect things like it. Boy, it's sure is a blessing when people are nice to you. And, you know, we try to be nice to one another, don't we? And thank the Lord for it. All right, any other praises this morning? Yes, sir. So thank you, Jack. Uh, and started for Amen. It's a blessing. Any others? Yes, sir. Amen. Yeah. God's good to you, isn't he? Amen. God's good. Anybody else this morning? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Amen. We love y'all. It's always good to have you with us, too. I'm glad to see you both back. And I hope that vertigo is going away from Miss Betty. So praise the Lord for that. All right. Any others this morning? Any others? <laughs> 